it's great that you've come to join us in God's house this morning. You know, we've come into this place, in the stillness of this place, to meet with our God. And as we sit here in this quiet place and prepare our hearts to, to meet God, we'll seek His peace. And this morning, we're going to turn to Him 998 as we're seated, as we sing about what Jesus, what a beautiful name. We'll remain seated as we sing the hymn number 998. <clears throat> beautiful name. The name that calmed the, the spirits, the, the name that brought people to faith. And so this morning let's bow our heads as we come before the great and mighty God. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you this day for this time of praise. We come as one people to exalt your name through praise and through prayer. You are the mighty God who formed the stars in space, the one who spoke and the earth was formed. You are mightier and greater than we can ever imagine. Yet, Lord, you would count us as your children. Like children, we don't always meet the standards that you have set before us. Where we have failed, Lord, forgive us. Where we have left that proven pathway and gone our own way, just leaving you far behind, call us back, Lord and set our feet in a solid foundation of faith. Where we have lost sight of you, Lord, open our eyes to the wonders of faith. Where we have been deaf to your call, open our ears that we may hear and respond to the task that you have set before us. If we have lost the enthusiasm and the energy for your work, fill us anew with your spirit and lift us up renewed in heart and in energy for your work. We thank you for this place of worship. We thank you for the preaching of the word that has gone forth into our community from this place. We remember those of the past who have given so much to enable us to meet together in this place. May we be prepared to sacrifice our time and our monies in your service so that the gospel can still be proclaimed and people brought back to the one 
who made and died for them. In the midst of praise, Lord, we remember that you are present in all our troubles, present through all the changes of time. As you are with us today, be with your children in Turkey and in Syria as they slowly recover from the shock of the terrible earthquakes. Just bless the thousands of families mourning the loss of their loved ones today that they may find comfort in the community of love surrounding them. We thank you for the, the aid and the rescue workers who set through the rubble and the debris to rescue the living and yet bring the bodies of their one, loved ones back to their families. But we pray that you'll be with those displaced from their homes and the way of life and provide the basic needs of food and water and shelter. May they be given all the medical equipment that is required, Lord. May we weep with those who weep, holding each one of those affected in our hearts. But this morning we remember the war in Ukraine that still rages on, and we pray for those who have lost loved ones. We remember homes, Lord, that have been destroyed, families ripped apart, death coming to the doorstep. But be with those who mourn this day. Draw close to all. Jesus, Prince of Peace, cover this country with your wings of peace that we may bring about an end to this war. But this morning we remember young people at secondary school who are about to set their exams in the next four weeks. And we just pray this morning, Lord, that you'll give them a clarity of thought and you'll give them a peace within their souls that they may be able to withstand the pressures placed upon their young lives at this time. For us here in this place, all we ask is your strengthening presence to be, to be with us this day, to be with us in the coming days. And as we meet together, may we know your presence, Lord, that you'll come and you'll sit beside us in the pew. You'll draw close to each and every one of us. So continue with us in our service of praise because we ask these things in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Well, you know, <clears throat> many a time when I was working, someone would say, who do you think you are? If you could tell them some bad news, and I'm sure people who have had to deliver bad news have been asked, who do you think you are? Well, I wondered exactly who am I? And so I put my details of my father's Welsh side into a search engine and it came up with some pretty surprising answers. Now according to FamilySearch.org, I'm the 11th cousin three times removed of President Franklin D. Roosevelt. What can I say? I'm the 12th cousin once removed of Shirley Temple on the good ship Lollipop. I'm the twelfth cousin once removed of Sir Winston Churchill. And a twelfth cousin once removed, wait for this, of Princess Diana. And I never got an invite to the wedding. She must have forgot that day. Now I'm the thirteenth cousin once removed, this is for the older people, of Lucille Ball of I Love Lucy. And I'm the thirteenth cousin of the king of rock and roll, Elvis Presley. Now, David, you know that's no truth. You've heard me singing. But I can tell you this morning that Elvis has definitely left the building. But, you know, there's more to contend with. And looking at all this, when I looked through all this, I came to the conclusion that our cart had run through their alley because there was no way I could be related to, to all these people. But, <clears throat> so it would appear that, you know, I'm related to the king of rock and roll Elvis Presley. But I'm related to one who is a king. He's the king of kings. You know, 2 Corinthians 6 and verse 18 says this, 
I will be a father to you and you will be my sons and daughters. That's what God says. I will be a father to you and you will be my sons and daughters. You know, when you accept and you acknowledge Jesus Christ as your Savior, something wonderful happens. God becomes your heavenly Father and we become sons and daughters of the King of Kings, members of the family of God, more wonderful than being related to Elvis Presley, the King of Rock and Roll. More wonderful is that relationship we have with God the Father because we're all members of the family of God. You know, the hymn we're about to sing acknowledges that. It tells us that Jesus taught us how to be a family, loving one another with the love that he gives. And I pray that in this place there is a true family of God, caring and sharing for one another. And to me, that's what it's all about. When we come together in front of the fire as sons and daughters of our heavenly king, we are a family, and a family takes care of one another. So this morning, let's stand as we sing 376. 376. Jesus put this song into our hearts. Good morning to you all. Uh, the minister is on holiday for the next two weeks, so if anybody has any emergency whereby they need a minister, please contact either Bobby or myself. I'd like to thank Bobby for filling in for us this morning, but I don't know whether just to say thanks or to curtsy or to bow. Or... Okay. I'm gobsmacked, actually. Now, uh, next week we will have here taking the service, Nigel Kenny. Now, Nigel is from the Christian Institute, so it'll be quite interesting to hear what Nigel has to tell us next week. No evening service tonight or next week, and no midweek fellowship. There'll be a choir practice tomorrow night at half past seven. Thursday the 4th of May, half past seven, we have our next diaconate meeting. And on Sunday, the 7th of May, to celebrate the King's coronation, we'll have a barbecue here in the church grounds, weather permitting, eh, after the morning service. It'd be lovely to see you all then. So I think I've covered all the intimations. Thank you very much.
Well, our reading this morning is taken from the book of Micah. Now, Micah is one of the 12 minor prophets. Only seven chapters, but let me tell you, it's worth reading. It's an easy read, but it's actually a warning. You know, this afternoon at three o'clock, we are going to have an emergency alert. A siren will sound on your mobile phones, and it's to tell you that there may be danger of life near you. Now, this reading from Micah, we see the prophet providing a national alert. The nation was in danger of moving away from God. They had forgotten him. Times were great. God was in the background. And they questioned his authority. And Micah, this minor prophet, was charged by God to bring the nation back to him. And so we're going to read from Micah chapter 6, and we're reading from verse 1. Listen to what the Lord says. Stand up, plead your case before the mountains. Let the hills hear what you have to say. Hear, O mountains, the Lord's accusation. Listen, you everlasting foundations of the earth. For the Lord has a case against his people. He's lodging a charge against Israel. My people... What have I done to you? How have I burdened you? Answer me. I brought you up out of Egypt and redeemed you from the land of slavery. I sent Moses to lead you, also Aaron and Miriam. My people, remember what Balak, the king of Moab, counseled and what Balaam, son of Beor, answered. Remember your journey from Shittim to Gilgal, that you may know the righteous acts of the Lord. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow down before the exalted God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with with thousands of rams, with ten thousands rivers of oil? Shall I offer my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has showed you, O man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Amen. And may God add his rich blessing to this reading from his holy word. As we prepare to hear God's word, we're going to turn to him 1116. There is a higher throne. This is a lovely hymn, and it's a hymn that will come our souls as we sing it. And so let's stand, I think, to sing this. There is a higher throne, 1116, as we stand. It's a higher throne Lord, we're faithful ones from every tongue. One day come, 
He has shown you, O oh man, what God requires of you. To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. These are words that we've probably heard a thousand times. Words that are still as relevant today as they were 700 years before the birth of Christ. This passage of Scripture is just as relevant today as it was when it was written over 700 years ago, just before Christ was born. It talks about the issues that we are experiencing today with the nation veering dangerously away from the Word of God. And I thank God this morning for the many learned people who have taken time to study Scripture and to make comment that assists theological minnows like myself to understand the Scripture. You know, of all TV programs and books, my favourite is anything to do with law. I think I should have been a lawyer. Books by John Grisham, courtroom dramas like A Few Good Men or Judge John Deed, along before them Perry Mason. Do you remember Perry Mason with Della Street? Paul Drake, the private detective, coming in at the last moment with evidence to prove the innocence of the accused. I love these TV series. I relish them. I love the twists and the turns of the legal system with the plaintiffs laying out their accusations and the defense replying with all the legal jargon and legal precedents. The last minute of witnesses and evidence being submitted to convince the jury of innocence or guilt and the final verdict on the accused. You know, before we study the message of Micah, we need to understand the role of biblical prophets. Now, it's been said that the biblical prophets were fortune tellers who predicted the future. Let me tell you, biblical prophets were not fortune tellers, gazing into some crystal ball, but prophets such as Isaiah and Jeremiah, such as Micah, knew God's word. And they looked over society and saw gaps between what God wanted and how people were behaving. The prophets intervened to help people to get back into the right road of living and back to God. They were concerned with events and conditions and they tried to correct and influence people within the society in which they lived. Now Micah was one of these prophets who addressed the people during the days when the elite prospered whilst everyone else limped behind with the poor being crushed. Micah saw the system rigged against the poor with oppressive taxes, with corruption, with judges on the take. And Micah was to call, Micah was to call to confront the people and to the nation of Israel and to bring them back to repentance in God. That was the mission of Micah, to bring the nation back to repentance and back to God. Now Micah himself is relatively unknown and his background is unclear. He was born in a small town in the south of Judah. It is thought he was probably a small-time farmer. And I think that's great because it means that God uses everyone to deliver his message. Not just the, the mighty prophets, but the small farmer who had the mind and the heart of God. And yet God, God called him to deliver a warning to Israel. The minor prophet Micah is probably most remembered for his foretelling of the birth of Christ in Bethlehem. Micah 5 verse 2 says, But you in Bethlehem, Epaphra, though you are small amongst the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be the ruler over Israel, whose origins are from old, from ancient times. We're all familiar with these words from Micah. We read them at Christmas. Now the book of Micah was penned some 700 years before the birth of Jesus. It's thought that Israel was at that time experiencing a bit of a revival. The temples and the synagogues were crowded. Offerings were abundant for the first time in years. Things were going great. What could be better? The people must have thought that God was pleased with them and with what was, ha with what was happening. Attendance at the synagogues up, plenty of income, and then onto the scene comes Micah, 
this small town family criticizing the leaders for the lack of justice and the love of evil instead of the love of God. There was, as one commentator said, people who rejected justice and made crooked that which was straight. To put it in modern parlance, Micah is calling out the leaders of the people for paying lip service to God. They had this outward show of religious devotion, but no signs of inward change. No transformation in their attitudes and in their lives. Their faith was only skin deep, and God was angry, and God was upset. As one commentator said, God didn't give a hoot about their elaborate services or, or magnificent buildings. He didn't care about their great music or their eloquent prayers if their worship didn't translate into treating people fairly during the rest of the week. And so God, through Micah, challenges them. Now, I want you this morning just to imagine that you're in a courtroom. The plaintiff is God. The defendant is Israel. The charge against Israel is not clear, but the conversations between them suggest that the people are complaining about God's expectations of them. That sounds a wee bit familiar today. Now, Micah, God's man, addresses Israel, and he says, What I'm about to say comes from God and not me. I didn't make this up. It comes straight from God. Listen to what the Lord says. My people, what did I ever do to you? How have I wearied you that you no longer have this close, trusting relationship with me? Answer me. You can almost hear the anger in God's voice. Answer me. Did I not bring you out of bondage? Did I not deliver you from your enemies? Didn't I give you splendid leaders during your time of salvation in the person of Moses, of Aaron and Miriam? Does your well-being as individuals not depend on me? Have you not always been at the center of my beating heart? You are my chosen people. God wanted the Israelites to remember these things so that they may come to a fuller realization of what he has done for them. The saving arts of the Lord, the consistent faithfulness, compassion, and mercy of God. But they failed God, but God never failed them. You would think that after hearing what God had given and done for them, they would realize their faults and they would admit their failures, falling back in the forgiveness of God. <laughs> but no, they started to bargain with God. Just as a child who has done something wrong, they try to talk their way out of the situation. It's just like, you know, remember as parents, your child will do something wrong, you give them around and say, but, but dad, and they started to try and justify their actions. They saw God as being unreasonable. They saw God as never been satisfied, always disappointed in them. What will it take to please you, God? Will a burnt offering of a year old calf or a thousand rams or a thousand rivers of oil? Will I sacrifice my firstborn child, the fruit of my body for the sins of his soul? Will that be enough, Lord? The people's response reflects a view from those outside the church that God is unreasonable, that God is never satisfied and that he's permanently disappointed in us because we're not perfect. They see religion with a long list of do's and don'ts. Do this, but don't do that, or else. People feel isolated from God through rules that are placed upon them, not by God, but sometimes by the church itself. We need to help people who are put off by a negative religion to find at the church, this church, a place of imperfect people. There's support and there's love that makes them feel welcome and makes them feel valued. 
and the earth-shattering news of God's kingdom has been diluted so much in an attempt not to hurt people's feelings that the message has lost its attractiveness, its power and joy. We've diluted the message so it don't hurt people's feelings. The gospel does hurt people's feelings because the gospel says you're living your life the wrong way. You're living away from God. And people are hurt when they hear that because they know they have to change the way they live and they need to change their outlook of living. I remember being in a church, and it's not a church in Cumnock, may I say, where it looked like people had been seeking the silk plumes for years. It's almost they were afraid of opening up their lives to God's presence and experiencing God's joy. And when speaking to a wonderful messenger of God who had preached in the same place just after me, he said if he felt sad before the service, he felt despondent after it. The house of God should be a place of wonder, a place of joy, a place where we meet and experience the uplifting and joyful presence of God. The late Queen Elizabeth once left a service in Westminster Cathedral and she said to the Archbishop of Canterbury as she walked through the door that no one should leave a Christian service feeling worse than when they went in. The vision of Christ was a world where God ruled in every heart. A world of giving, a world of sharing, a world of peace, a world of justice. A world of harmony and unity with unconditional acceptance, forgiveness and love. It should be a place where God works through ordinary people to make it a better place for all. And I can just imagine Micah when he heard the reply of the people with their gripes, whatever I do is not enough, God. He must have felt, you know, like Judge Rinder on the television, who, having listened to all the petulant arguments of the people, he shakes his head, he just says, come on. I believe we all know what is required by God. It's simple. Be a decent human being. He has showed you, O oh man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. You know, I wrestled with the word of mercy, and I came to the conclusion that mercy is a loving kindness. So love means being kind. What does the Lord require of us? To act justly. You know, justice comes from the Hebrew word for making it right. Do we lobby our politicians for policies that make it fair so that everyone in life is a fair shot? You know, Benjamin Franklin said this, Justice will not be served until those unaffected are as outraged as those who are. We can never be neutral in justice. Archbishop Desmond Tutu, a man I had a great respect for, reminds us that if you choose to remain neutral in situations of injustice, you have chosen the side of the oppressor. And he added, if an elephant has its foot in the tail of a mouse and you say that you're neutral, the mouse will not appreciate your neutrality. Justice comes not when a few activists get hit up, but when masses remember that silence is consent and we do our best to make things right. When we do justice and make things right, we set a great example for our children and for generations to come. What does God require of you? To act justly. But God requires you to love kindness. Note this. It's loving kindness, not niceness. There's a difference between being nice and being kind. A nice person may tell someone that they're sorry they're not feeling too well. A kind person, on the other hand, will go out of their way to help, maybe by dropping off a meal or offering to do some shopping for them. And I challenge you this week to go beyond 
being nice. This week in your interactions with people, think what's the kindest thing that you could do in a situation? Because kindness is far deeper than niceness. To be kind, you need to care about people, to have that yearning in your heart, to reach out with love, with compassion, and with concern. Doing unto others as God has done unto you. It is, as one commentator said, God has been faithful to you. Be faithful to others. God has forgiven you. Forgive those who hurt you. God has been patient with you. Show patience with others. God has been there in your time of need. Be there for others in their time of need. What does God require of you? To act justly and have loving kindness. Lastly, God requires us to walk humbly. Humility is a hard road to walk. The word humble has its roots in the word humus, which means from the earth. Being humble means grounded, having your feet planted firmly in the ground. And humility means that you don't fill yourself up with yourself. It's as the Alcoholics Anonymous slogan puts it, the challenge is not thinking less of yourself, but thinking of yourself less often. With humility, we accept our place as one amongst many others, approaching each task, even the most menial task, with joy. You know, I remember the story of an American who was visiting India just to go over and see the work of Mother Teresa. The American stood and he watched an old nun cleaning an infected leg wound. It was oozing pus and the smell was pungent. And looking on, he said to the old nun, I wouldn't do that for a million dollars. And the old nun turned and said, neither would I. That is humility in action. Hudson Taylor, the famous mystery to China, was scheduled to speak at a large meeting in Melbourne, Australia. The leader of the service introduced the missionary in eloquent and in glowing terms. He told the congregation all that Hudson Taylor had accomplished in China, then presented him as our illustrious guest. Hudson Taylor stood quietly for a moment <clears throat> and opened his message by saying, Dear friends, I am a little servant of an illustrious master. A little servant of an illustrious master. You know, we're all servants of an illustrious master. People who daily need to seek the master's direction. Servants who daily need to absorb his words. And when we walk humbly with God, when we are in harmony with him, two hearts beating as one, we are most likely to act justly, to love kindness, and to walk humbly. What does God require of us? Simply to be decent human beings, to act justly, to love kindness, to walk humbly with our God. It's not hard. It's easy. Three things. Justice, kindness, and humility. May God give us all these three things. Let's pray. Lord, you have shown us the meaning of justice, of kindness, and of humility. You took a basin of water, Lord, and a towel, and you washed and dried the disciples' feet. The great master becoming the servant king. Your time for the lowest in society, for the sick, the despised, and the hurt. No one or no task was below you, Lord. May we this day be examples of people who seek out injustice, who practice kindness and follow with humility the work you have laid before us. For this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to close our service this morning by singing 162 from heaven you came 
the servant king. And let's stand as we sing this from the bottom of our hearts. From heaven you came, helpless babe, you entered our world, your glory veiled. Hymn 162, From heaven you came, and we'll stand. <laughs> 